<laughs> Our guest in this segment is from the 98th Delegate District. He is the Speaker Pro Tem, Delegate Paul Espinosa. Paul, good morning. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, John. Good to be with you. Good. Hi, Paul. Paul, you've been education chair, you've been majority whip, and now speaker pro tem. Which of these roles have you enjoyed more? Well, it's like trying to describe which of your children you like best, uh, Rob. Uh, oh, I can I, do that I, easily. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't think my kids would appreciate that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I tell you, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, each of those roles. Uh, each of them's a little different. I mean, with education, you know, as a member and then later as chair of that committee, I mean, you're really – you know, up to your elbows in uh, policy decisions, really helping to craft policy. I uh, was very, uh, uh, I was about to use the word fortunate, but uh, I don't know at the time, maybe it didn't seem too fortunate, but you may recall that mm-hmm. I was called back into uh, service as education chair during one of the special sessions where we enacted uh, what was uh, referred to as the omnibus education bill and uh, got uh, that bill through and uh, uh, but, you know, really started enacting uh, some of the education reform uh, that, uh, you know, we've expanded upon here in recent years. As WIP, I really enjoyed that role because not only, I, not only could I advocate for uh, our caucus uh, policies, but I could continue to advocate for education reform and uh you know, be involved in other reform, you know, in other areas of, of legislative action. So so that was uh, a, a really fun role, which uh, served in for four years. Uh, the uh, uh, As I think I shared with you on your program um, uh, late last year, early this year, uh, moving into the Speaker Pro Tem role, uh, that really kind of gives me an opportunity to – you know, uh, uh, practice uh, parliamentary procedure, uh, something that, you know, I have to admit, I'm a little bit of a geek when it comes to parliamentary procedure. I do enjoy, you know, that aspect of it. And uh, it was called upon uh, last session on a few occasions uh, to kind of pinch hit for our speaker pro tem and our speaker who were both out at the same time. And so had an opportunity to do, do, uh, you know, fill in for them and really enjoyed it, got uh, pretty good marks from the speaker. And uh, so when he asked if I would consider serving in that role uh, full time uh, this coming, uh, this session, uh, I I, I expressed that I'd be more than happy to do it. So uh, Suffice it to say, Rob, that I've really been very fortunate to have several uh, challenging roles, and I've enjoyed each one of them. This has been a lively session between Form Energy and the tax cuts that uh, we don't have a solution to just yet. There's been a lot going on and a lot of emotions around uh, these issues as well. Paul, let's talk about Form Energy first and foremost. And tell me, is this a done deal? Is this going to become law soon? Well, as I understand it, I believe the uh, the Senate has passed that legislation, and so um, I'm pretty sure that they passed that legislation. I'd, I'd have to really kind of look back, but it seems to me that I think that it was either passed or it was on final read. I think it has actually been passed the Senate, so it now goes to the governor for signature, and so I do think that uh, as far as the most recent uh, supplemental appropriation that we made, uh, I, I think that uh, will um, – will, uh, uh, you know, be signed by the governor. You know, for, for me, uh, Rob, uh, you know, I think it was a relatively easy decision to make. I certainly realize that there are some folks which would, 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 that have, uh, you know, very different op- opinions, uh, you know, and, and I'd, I'd say that of the folks that have uh, uh, reached out to me uh, opposing uh, this uh, supplemental funding for Form Energy, you know, some of them I'd say probably fall in the category of, you know, they just don't think that states you know, should be getting involved in this type of economic development as far as, you know, uh, uh, you know, making, uh, you know, uh, appropriations for incentives, you know, to attract, you know, businesses like Form Energy or Nucor or Procter & Gamble or Macy's. But I think uh, personally, I think that that's fairly short-sighted. I, it, while, you know, I can, I can appreciate those uh, purists who just don't want to play that game. I think the reality is, is that if we do want to attract quality job creators to West Virginia, you, you almost have to engage in, you know, economic development activities to, to include incentives. And if you look at, uh, you know, what the 
Department of Economic Development has accomplished since we formally created that department here just a few years ago. Uh, just uh, since um, just over the last uh, couple years, uh, they have attracted more than $6.3 billion in private investment. Now, does that entail um, incentives uh, to provide infrastructure and, and other support for those projects? Yes, but I think to attract uh, some of the, job, the quality job creators that we have, uh, I, I think it's, it's uh, uh, again, a, a relatively easy call for me. And to support that, Rob, uh, you, typically, whenever we have a significant economic development project, we ask the WVU John Chambers College of Business and Economics Bureau of Business and Economic Research to, you know, take a look at those projects and provide us their uh, assessment as to what the likely economic impact would be of uh, an incentive uh, that might be provided to a, a potential business. And when they looked at the Forum Energy deal, uh, their findings w were, were pretty staggering. They said that by 2029, our total $290 million incentive is estimated to generate an annual economic impact of more than $2.1 billion. So again, for a total of uh, uh, a maximum of $290 million, we're going to likely see a $2.1 billion annual economic impact. And that's for a, an area of West Virginia that's desperately in need of economic development. I mean, we've been very fortunate to attract quality businesses in, in the eastern panhandle, uh, many of them as a result of you know, some incentives. Uh, but you know, to be able to generate you know, that type of economic activity for a really depressed area, that Weirton, uh, West Virginia area in, in northern West Virginia, to me, I think it's something that will help spread you know, the, the, the positive economic activity that we're seeing in a few parts of our state to an area that desperately needs it. Bill, is interesting to me on Friday with a wide array of political viewpoints at this table, from conservative Republican to liberal Democrat, four of the five panelists were against this investment. You were the only one that stood up for it. Yeah, I'm a little surprised with that as well. Uh, we talk about the economic impact. The 750 jobs are being generated, a common multiplier times seven. So we a, a lot of a lot of people are being impacted uh, just for this. Uh, I think it's e ideologically driven versus a, the practical return. Uh, I don't think anybody can argue against the the benefit that comes from an investment such as this. So the resistance, the reluctance is going to be on ideology. Are we, is this something that we should invest in? But Paul, you've made a very strong point and a point that's been made by numerous people that if we do not play this incentive game, we don't gain, we don't get anybody. They're just that simple. And you said some incentives and you mentioned several companies. Well, I take issue with the word some all of them, all of them have received incentives. Well, Bill, I think another uh, another concern that that I've heard loud and clear is uh, is some of the ESG statements uh, that Forum Energy and some of their investors have made, uh, and some of their you know stated goals of reducing uh, you know, the United States' reliance on fossil fuels and. To that, I would say, you know, if you look at virtually any website of any Fortune 500 company in West Virginia, you're probably going to see very similar type statements. And now, does that does that uh, sometimes uh, give me pause? You know, when when you hear of uh, of companies that are interested in. Uh, I would say hastening the, the demise of the fossil fuel industry. Uh, it, it does, because I do believe that fossil fuels will continue to play a significant role in providing baseload energy needs in, in West Virginia and the United States for the foreseeable future. But I think that's just where uh, major companies are. And I think if, we're go if that's going to be the bar that we're going to establish, that we're not going to provide incentives for any company that makes uh, statements uh, along those lines, 
then again, we might as well close the doors to our economic development office and say, you know, we're not going to we're not going to you know try to attract these jobs. So I think this uh, particular job, uh, th- this uh, particular project, while uh, certainly there are some statements that that have been made by the investors that that do give me a reason for pause. Uh, the reality is is that this company is going to be building uh, uh, high capacity batteries, industrial batteries that are really agnostic with regard to what type of energy they store. Uh, to my understanding, uh, one of the stated purposes of these batteries is to assist our electric utilities in ensuring that there is uh, sufficient power during uh, periods of peak demand. And and we've seen some of those challenges that the United States has experienced here uh, during really cold spells where uh, sometimes we're really pushing up against what our electric utilities can provide during uh, periods of peak uh, demand. To my understanding, these uh, large-scale industrial batteries will uh, be utilized by our electric utilities, many of which, most of which, are fueled by natural gas and coal uh, in, in that effort to make sure that they can store uh, some reserve of power so that during peak uh, periods of demand, they'll be able to meet that demand. So, you know, again, I think folks can can take exception to statements that uh, companies make. But in this particular case, this is going to provide excellent jobs that are going to directly uh, positively impact West Virginians. And again, for me, it was really an easy call. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Paul. Um, that's morning, John. If you don't mind shifting over to the uh, tax plans. Uh, <laughs> Sitting here looking at at my notes, I I see two entirely different tax plans. There's the one that was passed by the House, and then there's an like not even a very little resemblance by what came from the Senate. So my question to you is: as the negotiations go on to to try to find some way to send uh, tax money back to the citizens, in the Senate version we got uh, the elimination of the marriage penalty, the car tax rebate, the income tax fifteen percent instead of five zero percent. Uh, reduction. Where do you see the most likely points of compromise and the most likely points of friction as we go through the reconciliation process? Well, John, as uh, as leader, householder, and uh, others have, have, have shared on your show, um, there are uh, ongoing discussions with the Senate and the governor's office, and and I think progress is being made. Where we end up ultimately, John, I think remains to be seen. But I, I think that uh, you know it'll likely. Uh, uh, include uh, components of both plans, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, personal income tax relief, which is uh, an area that the House is really focused on. Uh, the Senate, uh, you know, still uh, believes that there is value in providing some relief for uh, small businesses through uh, uh, re- uh, either refunding or, or some type of relief for the, the tax on business equipment and inventory, uh, also possibly the governor's proposal to uh, rebate uh, the uh, personal income tax, uh, personal property tax on, on vehicles. What exactly, at what levels each of those uh, ends up at, I, I think remains to be seen. Uh, I've, I've participated uh, to a limited extent uh, in some of those uh, uh, discussions. And I think the best thing that I can say, John, is that there are uh, very productive discussions that are, that are taking place. One of the areas that I think uh, is uh, where, where I think it, it clearly there, there needs to be agreement before you really are able to uh, come down to a, a final tax relief proposal is, you know, what is the level of additional spending that you're uh, you know, that the House and the Senate and the governor can agree upon. You know, there are some big ticket items out there, uh, PEIA, for example. You know, how much additional money are we going to have to put into PEIA? There are some other, you know, um, uh, proposed uh, expenditures that would likely impact, you know, base spending, you know, just in order to take care of, you know, uh, 
you know some uh, some needs that uh, that I think uh, you know both the House and the Senate uh, would agree upon. For example, you know trying to improve the pay of our cor- correctional workers. Where you know right now, uh, as you may be aware, we are in a state of emergency uh, where we have uh, National Guard's men and women. Uh, uh, Supplementing our correctional staff, you know, in our in our prisons and and uh, in, in jails uh, here in West Virginia. Uh, so, you know, how can we uh, provide some additional pay there, which would be a base, uh, you know, increasing uh, type of expenditure? So, those are the type of things where I think uh, it's a very important for the House and the Senate and the governor to coalesce behind. You know, what what portion of the uh, additional revenues that we have will we dedicate to ongoing expenditures as well as some capital expenditures to address uh, some of the deferred maintenance that that we're still trying to catch up on here in West Virginia. And then I think once that's defined, and I think we are getting closer to uh, to what that number looks like, I think that will uh, further define, okay, uh, if you consider these additional expenditures, you know, both o- ongoing and, uh, and one-time expenditures, uh, what additional money is left in order to uh, provide uh, tax relief? So I, I'm optimistic, John. I, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to come out, but I think as we're able to uh, get agreement on what the spending levels are going to be, I think that will lend itself to reaching agreement on a uh, meaningful uh, tax relief uh, plan. Paul, along those lines, uh, the tax cut and the additional spending, are you still working within a cap of approximately $600 million? Uh, I think that remains to be seen, uh, Bill. I, I think, uh, you know, what we've heard, uh, I think, from the Senate is uh, perhaps a little bit uh, above that $600 million mark. Uh, you know, I think the House, uh, you know, um, you know, has uh, has been looking at that figure, but uh, again, I, I think it's uh, it's it's probably going to be somewhere between you know six hundred and nine hundred is what my guess is, but uh, that's really you know one of the big issues that I think the House and the Senate need to come agree come that, into agreement on. That's funny you say nine hundred million because uh, Senator Tarr has been very firm that. Uh, uh, Somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred million is the maximum that we can do without jeopardizing our future uh, uh, future funding. So, how has he compromised down from nine hundred million to something in the neighborhood of six hundred million? Well, I don't want to speak for uh, for Senator Tarrant. I'm not familiar with the specific comments that you're referencing there, Bill, but. Uh, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we are hearing from members, uh, I think on both sides of the uh, Capitol, is, you know, how do we address some of these uh, some of these needs like correction officers, uh, other, you know, uh, ongoing type of expenditures, as well as try to fund some of the capital expenditures that I referenced. And so where that number ultimately comes down and what that looks like um uh, I, I, again, I, I think that's really the the crux of the of the discussions that are taking place now. Does the governor's office have a seat at the table of these discussions? Absolutely. Uh, uh, I know he's participated in uh, several of the meetings that I've been involved in, as well as his staff. And uh, so, uh, all uh, both the House, the Senate, and the governors uh, they're they're all have all have been uh, actively participating in these discussions. Speaker Pro Tem, Delegate Paul Espinosa, our guest on the program. Paul, I count nine bills on your page that you're sponsoring. A couple of these uh, really jump off the page to me, one of which is HB 3401 relating to negligent homicide. I know you've heard our discussions with Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey on these. Can you tell me if this is gaining any steam in the House? Well, uh, actually, I think I'm up to about 52 bills that I've co-sponsored, and uh, <laughs> but uh, the bill that you referenced, I have been working very closely with uh, a prosecuting attorney, uh, Jefferson County prosecuting attorney Matt Harvey. Uh, as I shared with you, uh, I think uh, maybe after uh, Friday's program, I've uh, we've been working very closely with Senator Weld, who's a former prosecuting attorney himself, and of course is vice chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. It looks like Senate Bill 660 will be the vehicle that will we'll be using in order to address that issue that that Matt described. Uh, The uh, 
the Senate has a little later bill introduction deadline than we do. And so uh, based on the discussions that we had uh, between the three of us, uh, uh, Senator Weld introduced Senate Bill 660. And Senate Bill 660 uh, essentially would uh, establish the aggravated criminal offense of reckless driving resulting in death as an additional um you know, criminal acts. So uh, we believe that that is probably the best way to address the concerns that that uh, Matt Harvey uh, brought to our attention. Yeah, I certainly didn't mean to undersell your involvement in bills. Just going off your page, it said you're the lead sponsor of nine. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's been a it's been a busy session, and uh, I really have not had a chance to really uh, look at a lot of the bills that I've uh, sponsored. But uh, uh, we'll be uh, focusing on them this week, trying to make sure that as many of them get out of committee as possible. All bills essentially have to be out of their, uh, their out of committees by this Sunday uh, in order to have three readings uh, next week. So uh, we'll be uh, generally nudging a few of these bills that uh, are still in committee. There's the uh, one also, HB 3009, related to voting rights of formerly incarcerated individuals. What are you hoping to accomplish with that one? Well, that was a bill that was brought to my attention. I guess West Virginia is is one of apparently a, a relatively few number of states where you you don't actually get your voter uh, your voter rights restored until you've not only completed your prison sentence but you've also completed your parole or you know any other terms of your of your sentence. And uh, but from what I understand, I think there was a similar bill uh, over in the Senate that uh, did not meet a very good fate. Uh, it, it's pr- been pretty well um, defeated over in the Senate. So I doubt that we're going to pursue it in the House, knowing that the Senate is not likely to act favorably on it. And HB 2569, establishing the Motorsport Responsibility Act. What is that? Well, that was a direct result of one of the business roundtables that uh, Speaker Hanshaw and the Eastern Panhandle delegation uh, hosted, uh, I think back in September. Uh, Summit Point Speedway uh, came to us and asked uh, about introducing legislation that would put them on kind of a, a similar footing as other recreational sports with, with, with a degree of risk. For example, if you go to a ski resort, you know, by, you know, um, entering the ski resort and participating, you are, you know, you're assuming a, a degree of, of, uh, of risk, of liability there, self-liability. Uh, and so this would make it clear that participants in motorsports, not only at Summit Point, but other uh, motorsports parks around uh, West Virginia, it would make clear that those participants are acknowledging that there is a degree of risk associated with those activities. So it would really help out with their uh, liability insurance, which uh, apparently has become uh, a pretty significant expense for those uh, for those um, uh, businesses. Final question for Delegate Espinosa. Yeah, very quickly, Paul, and it's going to be very quick. Uh, we in the Eastern Panhandle have been, over the years, uh, envious that we have not had more in leadership and now we do have leadership in both the senate and the house your role as speaker pro tem is more as i understand it more than just uh occasionally filling in for the speaker you're actually in the inner circle within the inner circle of all the decision made uh, decision being made and promoted in the house is that correct that's right, Bill. Uh, I, I do uh, sit in on uh, each of our uh, leadership meetings and before each floor session, involved in the uh, review of the of the of the that day's agenda, just to be prepared uh, for you know what might take place that day. So very uh, uh, very thankful that the speaker has uh, has entrusted me with this role, and and happy to join uh, our other Eastern Panhandle uh, delegates and leadership uh, in uh, in serving uh, serving the House. Paul, thank you so much. We appreciate your time this morning. Any final thoughts? Uh, just a busy week again. Uh, we've got. Uh, my wife reminded me uh, yesterday as I was leaving home. She said three weeks left, and it's like wow. It's just it's hard to believe that that it's uh, just about uh, uh, toward the end here. Of course, the session uh, ends at midnight on March 11th, so it'll be a busy few weeks. But I'm uh, I'm optimistic that we'll get uh, some good things across the finish line, including uh, some meaningful tax uh, relief. When's crossover date, Paul? Uh, crossover date, uh, referring to my calendar here, it looks like uh, March the 1st. March 1st. March 1st is the 50th day. Hey, who's your roomie this year? 
Same uh, uh, delegate householder. We uh, continue to share a uh, a townhouse uh, here uh, just outside Charleston, and so uh, I think this is my, well. This is my eleventh year, so uh, and I think he's probably been in. Uh, this is his thirteenth year, so uh, we we've enjoyed. Uh, 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 being roomies together down here in Charleston. Very nice. Well, thanks so much, Paul. Appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Always appreciate the opportunity, guys. Have a great day. Speaker Pro Tem Delegate Paul Espinosa.